So, uh, yeah, my game was Froggy Rain, so I'm gonna talk about that, my experience with the Game Jam. This is my game, I made it completely solo, the art, music, programming, all that stuff. It's a simple dodge the objects game. You avoid the frogs until the end of the song, and then you win. Easy. Um, so the concept, this is the first game jam that I did solo. I have done a few game jams before, but I always did just art and or music. So I wanted to, from the start, just have a very simple game. Of course, I knew of the concept of cloning games, so I kind of just, not even kind of, I literally looked up a list of like easy to clone games. It's like, all right, I'll just pick one of these. I think this will be a good start to making a game. And so as I was looking around, I kind of thought if any of these were giving me good concepts for games. Genuinely, I don't remember how I came to the frog rain concept. This whole jam was a fever dream and my sleeping schedule was still messed up from it. So no clue how I got there, but I did. Uh, in any case, I wanted to focus a lot on the presentation of the game because, well, that's what I'm good at, art and music and stuff like that. And my general philosophy was keep the scope of this small and add on more stuff later if I have time. So to start, we'll talk about the art with the development. Um, one of the first things I wanted to do was develop an art style. Generally, that is, this applies to any artistic project that I do. I make a style based on the project itself. For this particular game, I thought like a cute, simplified art style would work best because of like the silly concept of the game and also because I would have to be drawing a lot in a short amount of time. I actually reused a character from a previous Game Jam game that I made. And this also made it easier to help with the style because I didn't have to worry about the design. I already had a design. I had to just focus on how I was drawing it. And so I made this like little picture to use as a reference so that they would look consistent throughout all the art. But if you have a keen eye and you probably notice that they do not look consistent through the art of my game because I didn't actually look at the reference that I made. Hooray. So I actually had some uh, quite a few concept sketches of like the title screen cover art before I settled on something. And this is actually before I decided on the art style. The first thing I did was just draw a bunch of concepts then I realized this isn't working. So I went back to the drawing board, settled the whole art style thing, and then went back to it. I don't even remember what I was doing for half of these. Like the one on the bottom right is the full concept. It's just a frog face. And then I gave up and went to a new sketch. And that was actually the very first sketch I did for this game. I don't even know how to draw frogs. So I don't know what I decided with this game concept. It's really an enigma. And I have some storyboards of the, the cutscene I made for the game as well. Making a cutscene is actually one of the things I wanted to do from the start. I wasn't sure if I would be able to fit it in, but about like halfway through the game jam, I realized I do have time. And so I made one. Um, I decided it's like four panels because four panels is like, you can tell any story with it. It's the simplest way to tell a story. And so that's what I went with. Again, wanted to keep the scope small. So I just drew up these little storyboards and then boom, I made cutscenes. And then I just put it in iMovie to actually make the cutscene into like a video. And so moving on to audio. I don't have like a whole lot to talk about with art because I don't have much to learn when I already know so much about art. But with audio, I wanted to learn more about sound effects and whatnot because I, I know how to make music already. Though with this game, I realized there wasn't really much place to put sound effects in it because there was barely anything going on to begin with. I There's actually a reason that I have a little Easter egg. In the title screen, if you click on the frog on the wizard's hat, it makes a ribbit. That's because I downloaded the frog ribbit sound that realized I had absolutely nowhere to put it. So I just put it there. That's my single sound effect in this game. The rest is just music. <laughs> but my main idea for the audio was, well, the first thing I wanted to do was make a theme for like the main level. And then all the other songs are kind of optional. They come later. So this is actually what the track looks like, the main theme that I wrote. I wrote it in Logic Pro, which is basically just fancy GarageBand. So you can do it in GarageBand, same thing. Um, so when it came to developing the main theme, of course, I wanted to reflect what's going on as you play the game. It's a very like fast paced, quick game. So I was kind of thinking like chaotic, but not too much because it's a very silly, cute game. It's raining frogs. So it's like lighthearted and silly and combining those different attributes just made it sound more mischievous. Um, I pr experimented a lot with the instruments to give it that particular sound. 
Um, it took like two hours to write the main theme. Most of that I feel like was just picking instruments. Like I had the main thing written out and then just kept swapping out the instruments to see what would sound better. Um, and yeah, I do actually have the original like scrap draft of the main theme that I wrote. I wrote this in uh, MuseScore. Don't know if you can hear this, but it's just a little snippet. <laughs> Anyway, I hated this, so I immediately decided to write a new one. <laughs> it just did not fit the vibe I was going for at all, but in hindsight, I guess I appreciate that I wrote this little draft because when I wrote it and realized this does not fit, I immediately just went in the opposite direction from my next draft, and that ended up being the final one. So I suppose you can say that the best way to find the right answer is to find the wrong one first. And then let's see, some of the rest of the soundtrack, I mean, it didn't take me that long to write the main theme. And so I'm like, all right, I have time to write everything else. So the game over theme and the victory theme, they're just little jingles, not full out songs. The game over theme is actually reused from a previous game jam. I wrote it for the first game jam I did, then it was never implemented to the game. So I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna use it for this one because it fits. And then the victory jingle, that also actually took two drafts. I wrote a little one. I was like, no, this sucks. Wrote a second one. Okay, that's good. I consider making the victory theme a full song as like a reward. Like you beat the game. Now you get to listen to this cool song. And then I realized, eh, eh not necessary. Your reward is we protected the potion from the frogs. Be happy. Hooray. Um, as for the title theme, I just have question marks because again, this game jam was a fever dream. I don't remember how I wrote it. I think I just sat down, wrote it in 20 minutes, was like, yeah, that's good. I have no idea. That's just how it happens sometimes. Uh, and then the cutscene music, I thought about making like, you know, ambience and voice acting and sound effects and all of that. And I was like, no, I'm tired. It was like 7 a.m. and I hadn't slept at that point. I just altered the title theme music a little bit to give the cutscene a little, its own soundtrack of sorts. And then the fun part, the programming, which I know absolutely nothing about. I mean, I know the most basics of basics about code. I've taken coding classes back in back in the days when I was years younger. So I kind of was I was confident I'd be able to figure it out because I knew enough about it. But for the most part, I was kind of just following tutorials like how do this? How do that? How fix the bug? How unbreak the game? You know, that was kind of the process for making this whole thing. Um, yeah, as I said, I kind of just looked up everything I needed to do. And I experimented with it. I didn't just follow one tutorial, but a lot of tutorials. And so it's fun development screenshots. The main level scene is super small because I had no idea what I was doing. I did not realize you could change the camera size. And so I have these two different scenes and you can just see the size of it. It's, oh, it's so tiny. And then here's a little zoom in of the load bearing frogs. I did not know what to do with them. These, those frogs would break the game if I removed them, but they also had gravity properties. And the despawning thing was at the bottom of the scene and I couldn't have them fall into it or that would also break the game. So I just gave them this little platform on the side where they can just hang out together. And my YouTube history looks great. Never looked better. <laughs> and I think that's all I have to say about this one. So thanks yeah. for <laughs> I, I need to re restate something that you said earlier you got halfway through a game jam and said i can add more content you okay. said yeah i can add a cutscene and this was your first time your first time doing a solo yep was this the michael jordan flu game like this sounds like one hell of a fever dream <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, I had no idea what was going on this entire game jam. That was good inspiring. Stuff, Zen. Good stuff. <laughs> cool. And so next, Dad wants to go next. So yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. We yeah. Go. Woo. Oh, hold on. Okay, let's do this. Hold on. Mm. Okay. I'll share my screen. Um, 
Oh my god. <laughs> Wait, can I click shut? No, hold on. I have to share my screen and then click slideshow. Okay. Uh this. Can y'all see this? Yeah. Right. Cool. Okay, so hi, me and Thad are here to speak on behalf of the four people who made our wonderful game for this game jam called Fear uh, by the most wonderful Milky Way Studios. This is a horror game? Mm -hmm. Open uh, interpretation. It's, <laughs> it's an interpretation. We, we don't know. So, in case you haven't played this game. Actually, wait, is my... No, no, you guys can see the full screen. Okay. Uh, in case you haven't played, it is a 3D horror game where you explore a strange facility and you're not alone. That's the only exposition that you get. Um, this is just a snippet from the game, just so you can kind of see what it looks like. It's, you know, spooky. You've got your movement. You can look with your mouse. Um, and the only actions you have are to pick up objects and throw them. You have no offense, and you just need to escape from this strange facility. Now, you might be asking, what, you know, if you have a spooky facility, you gotta be running from something, and that, I'll be handing off to Thad. Uh, we have a monster, and that monster is our, our, our fella. Hmm. Yeah, so, Marissa had this fantastic idea where we were just... We're going to have, we wanted some kind of like maze, some kind of horror game where you have to navigate and find your way to the exit. And the gimmick of the game is you wouldn't have to make sound because the monsters are only going to be working with one sense, in this case, hearing. So as you can see by the model we made, the, the little guy has uh, above average size ears and uh, not much else to work with. Um, he can run at you and attack you as you'll eventually see if you haven't played already and modeling modeling this guy was very interesting it was a lot of fun i got to learn blender a lot and rigging and stuff and using blenders like animation tools it was very fun we had some issues with like when when the monster would run certain faces wouldn't look quite right right it does kind of look like dumbo we did bring up dumbo a lot during the creation of this creature <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah it's a uh, it was designed to be like somewhat goofy but also scary in the right context and i think we did a good middle ground between that it's definitely the highest poly object in the game but in our case it doesn't really matter because of the filter that we used like a the downscaling filter that we used in the game to pixelize everything but yeah we can go to the next slide so so yeah with a monster with big ears naturally you know every sound you make is gonna attract it so like if you're walking or running it's gonna come towards you so you know what better way to evade these fellas than with the ability to make sounds so that's where the throwing of items comes in so we made a uh, an ability to pick up items like in this uh, this is like the unity scene so you can see on the right the actual gameplay where you have an arc and you can throw like a bottle um and then yeah on the left when it hits something it temporarily enables and then disables a a uh, trigger space so if the guy like the map is on the left there you can see if the guy is anywhere in that space he's gonna start going towards that sound uh yeah so combined with like the ability to walk around the monster traversing and then you being able to throw things you can encounter a situation very similar to this scenario that we have here where you can pick up an object and then he can show up <laughs> well and you narrowly avoid him narrowly avoiding him if you can throw things in another direction uh now, you may be wondering, but there's nothing going on in this UI except for one thing, and that's kind of obvious. This strange bar here, <laughs> what is it? What could it possibly be? Uh, so what takes our game from just like a, a normal quirky a horror game where you have to avoid hearing things, uh, we a a added a <laughs> mic input. So at the beginning of the game, you have the option to adjust your uh, mic sensitivity 
So your mic is actually enabled the whole game. <laughs> so if you make sounds, it's actually gonna come over to you in real life, you know, you can make sounds. So what you can do is use that slider in the top screen to uh, make it so your normal speaking voice peaks there um, on the bar. And then you see in this bottom GIF, when you make sounds in the bottom right, you can see the red bar moving, it adjusts your collider. So it'll, if you make a loud sound, it's gonna like, it's gonna hear you. So it's immersive and kind of freaky that way. So you could have friends come up and sabotage you. Or if you see him and you're like, ah, you're in trouble even more. Uh, so yeah, that that's what uh that's how our game works essentially. Um, now Thad can go over some of the uh Thad did all, all like the made the whole map and did a lot of the like aesthetics and did all the the visuals of like the the filter. So uh, oops, how do I there? Uh, so you can go pick up aesthetics. Yeah, sure. Um... I want to make a horror game for a long time because I feel like horror more than any other genre relies on the atmosphere and it was very just fun making just like a purposely almost ugly environment but like one that was like I guess just one that was like unnerve the, the player and making it look more like old retro almost like a PlayStation 1 game I felt added a lot to the horror um, and we did a lot of this stuff without even touching shaders, too, which is another uh, benefit of, like, trying to tackle, like, more retro, like, a more retro feeling and just, like, going all in on, like, little tiny details, like, light flickering in distance, the the computer screen being on over there, just, like, little decorations that we can place in the environment. Uh, Julian did a lot of nice decorations that we could add to like make it so each room feels a little bit different from the last. And it also helps like when navigating the maze so you don't feel like, you. there's no question like, oh, did I already come into this room? Because there's like landmarks you can see just by looking at the decorations. Yeah, no, I really like that part too because you guys did a lot of the 3D modeling and it was great because like, when it comes to mazes like landmarks are crucial you're like oh shoot <laughs> i have i've been there oh god <laughs> um so yeah and then as essentially just like closing remarks uh while we were doing this game jam we all kept oh so so it was me thad but then also julian and morgan if you if you know them uh we were all the ones who made this game and as we were going through it we were like kind of realizing like wow this is one of our best game jams like we we're just doing really grand and so Together, like, uh, in some combination of, of our little Milky Way studios, we've made, like, at least six games together in, like, game jams. Um, and so what made this one stand out, I guess we, we used, like, all, a, like, accumulated, like, tips of what we realized work and doesn't work. Um, one of the first things was actually we just, like, actually slept properly and we, like, kind of took turns sleeping. That was actually one of the first ones where, like, oh, we could keep being productive. Mm -hmm. Um. But what we did with this game was, like, we kept scope really simple, like, really, really simple, along with, like, we had one requirement of the game, and that was something we hadn't really done so far. We always, like, naturally with any game, you, like, the moment it starts, you're like, oh, this cool idea, and this cool idea, and this, like, no, 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 we're gonna leave it to one thing and get it done. Like, it's not about making a long game. It's about, like, what can I, you know, if you have a really cool idea, just, like, even if it's just a demo, like, that's that's what a game jam is really all about, is, like, practicing a cool new thing and getting it to work and then being able to show it off. Of course, if you, like, can make it long, that's great, um, but it shouldn't be priority. Now, we actually, like, like I said, considered slope. We, we had, like, two or three very simple and specific goals, which was, the main one was, like, okay, we want mic input to attract the bad guys we're like okay once that was checked off we're like cool like we're almost done with what we want and then we were able to focus on literally everything else and then a really massive one was uh we actually pretended the game jam ended at like 4 p.m instead of 7 because we almost every game jam have fallen into the issue of uh running out of time and we don't even have a functioning build we're like wait a minute we have to submit in 20 minutes and all of a sudden the ui breaks and it's bad and so there was like a comforting feeling that like at 4 p.m we're like okay we're gonna all stop what we're doing we're gonna build it and then we're gonna set it aside in a folder called like safe folder um and then we were like cool so if all else fails we can at least submit a working version um but then luckily you know for the next three hours after that we 
tweaked it, improved it, and then once we like did like a, another improvement and we checked that the game was still working, we like updated the safe folder. Uh, we didn't delete it. We just you know added another one. Like okay, more recent safe version. Um, and it was just like really uh, it removed all the anxiety um, of the I don't know the jam and all that. So yeah, that's that's what I have to say. I don't know if that you can have any more words of of wisdom that you might impart. Uh, no, I I just it definitely was like one of the more chill jam jams that we did, and I feel like that was definitely for the better because we have a tendency to go with like pick a massive scope and then try to tackle it and our sleep just suffers because of it um definitely at a point i noticed during the jam where if i don't get enough sleep i just stop my just pr my productivity just like completely crashes and i think actually getting decent sleep this jam was very beneficial and like keeping like a, a small scope was very nice and it's turned out to be one of our best jams i think yeah um so oh oh hold on <laughs> uh, there we go hold on so yeah that, that that's that's pretty much it i don't even know if anyone has any questions or anything like that but that that's pretty much all we have to say uh, Dad, did you rig the the character i did yes are the are the ears like skeletons or are they uh, shaped the ears the ears have two bones in them i believe bones. okay okay they just they look so properly floppy i thought maybe you did like a <laughs> like a soft body sim and like shape keys that's awesome that's really <laughs> thank cool. you i appreciate it it was very fun to animate it's very different from the normal humanoid <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, we were thinking awesome. about having like some kind of colliders on the ears because we noticed that the monster would like when they <laughs> went into the hallways, sometimes the ears would clip through the hallways. So we thought about maybe like, yeah, right there. The ears could drag. Uh, yeah, like, <laughs> the ears could like drag on the walls, but we didn't get to implement that sadly. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been perfect. If we had more time, that, that pretty much would have been it. Because otherwise it, it really we we got everything we wanted to get done, but that would have just been a really funny <laughs> addition. <laughs> uh yeah um yes yeah, so i guess i guess uh, that, that that's it. everything I think. I think the trigger volume was also a very interesting choice i've seen some games do like big giant sphere triggers for various like levels of loudness but i've also seen other ones that just store like the distance every frame and check if like the distance is below whatever um so that's that, that's cool that's cool the big like yeah, the giant sphere that just flashes there for a second. Interesting choice. It seemed like the less like uh, functionality, like or, or, or like uh, performance intensive. It's just like just for a second, like if like oh, like the 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 bad guy he has like the an on trigger collect, uh, enter pretty much. That's like oh, oh, I I encountered something. Let me go towards that. So. Right, right. Cool, cool. Sounds good. Um, so. Mm -hmm. oh. Do you guys have anything to say? Okay, cool, cool. Uh, so moving right along, uh, anyone want to go next? If not, I will choose someone random from the people that I know have slides in the presenter chat. Um, I can go. Cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, let's figure this out. Do you want me to talk uh, you through it? Or are you good? Is it just screen one? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, screen one, unless you want to record audio and then do the browser instead. Yeah, well, yeah, there's no audio. Just, Sounds um, good then. Present. Crap, where is it? Where's present? Is it? Uh, oh, it's up here? Yeah. Uh, no, it's crap. How am crap, I like I, I haven't used it in a while. I think I it's you. Button. It's you? Oh, okay. Slideshow, slideshow presenter view. Okay. Is it working? Uh, yeah, just to minimize the other thing. Okay, uh, yeah, so um, this is my presentation about my game, Alice Inferno. Um, I wouldn't call this my first solo jam because I actually did it with my brother. He was responsible for a lot of the art for the destructible things. Let's get the timer started, actually. Um, but I did all the programming myself. I also did a lot of the character animations myself as well. So yeah, let's get started. Okay, so Alice Inferno is a game jam I did with my brother. Uh, it's based on the prompt, do not mix these two things together. And so we decided it'd be fun to mix 
adorable and innocent rabbits with fire. Today, we'll be talking about our 2D burn em up platformer game, the good, the bad, and the lessons we've learned. All right. And yeah, so I did all the character animations, the character designs, and the programming. And then my brother, who unfortunately isn't here today, um, he did all the destructible props, the UI, all the burnables as well. OK, so uh, this is the protagonist, Alice. Um, she hates anything cute, so she's going to set everything on fire. Um, and then the rabbits, basically, those are the main enemies of the game. And they basically try to run into you and uh, make sure you don't run into them, of course, because you'll have to restart the level. All right, and so let's show off some of the gameplay here. So basically, the objective, as I mentioned, is to just set everything on fire. And once you do, um, you'll beat the level. And so you're setting all the rabbits on fire. They're running for their lives. And then you're burning all their homes and stuff. But yeah, that's that's pretty much the gist of the gameplay. And so, uh, yeah, we, we have some enemy variants as well, like the the farmer rabbits. You'll encounter them later on in the game. Um, they basically throw carrots at you, so watch out for those. Um, and then we've got the chickens, um, which are pretty interesting. They don't hurt you on contact, but they multiply exponentially. As you can see, they just lay eggs, and then more chickens come from those eggs. And, uh, oops. Oh, why isn't it? OK, yeah, there we go. So we also have the secret agent rabbits as well. Um, they're basically like the, the boss rabbits. They basically call in airstrikes, and you have to watch out for them like that. You're you're seeing all the, the videos, right? I just want to make sure. OK, good. All right, and then of course, don't don't f with cats. All right, so um, number one thing I wanted to talk about today was the art style for Alice Inferno. So um, the first thing we came up with was Alice in Wonderland. We kind of wanted to to deal with rabbits and like a quirky, dreamy landscape with bright pastel colors and things. And so we wanted the style to be highly expressive, stylized, and adorable. And so I actually took a lot of inspiration from Pizza Tower because a lot of the character animations are like really, really expressive and like really over the top. So yeah. So I approach pixel art in terms of shape, language, and color theory. I focus on breaking past the silhouette utilizing asymmetry whenever I can, maintaining rhythm, um, making certain aspects of the character appealing, and then utilizing some of shape theory as well. And so here's the cat. This is the cat NPC you saw earlier. But basically, as you can see, I've broken him down into basic shapes. You can clearly see the head is disproportionately larger than the rest of his body. That's not common for cats, but I decided to do it for this cat because I really wanted to um, accentuate the the mean, evil, mischievous personality of the cat, and I also gave them gave him an arch spine, utilizing this um, line of action, and then I have these secondary lines of action as well. And so I made the tail really, really sharp, as opposed to what a normal cat's tail would look like, which is um, pretty curvy. And so, as you can see, for the two different run cycles, I made sure to play around with the silhouette to get ver two very different personalities in terms of the run cycle. So you can see the cat looks a lot more aggressive and then the rabbit on the other hand looks a lot more affectionate. And so for the cat, I had him sort of really compact, really leaning in towards the run. And you can clearly see his evil, angry ex expression on his face. And then for the rabbit, I have his arms out. So it looks like he's going in for a hug. And so, in my opinion, I think playing around with the shape, the line of action, and all of that stuff really uh, is really important for doing run cycles because it can give them a lot of character. And so another thing is, is that artists don't really conjure this stuff up from their minds. They always look at references from the outside world. And so as you can see, this cat right here is very, very similar to the cat for my game. All right, and so for Alice, um, 
I actually didn't draw up any concept sketches of her. I was basically just asked to do something really quick. And I, I think that's one of the fun things about game jams is that you don't really have time to like sit down and think of a character design. You have to come up with it like right that second. And so that's kind of what I did for Alice. I went for um, a pretty conventional, you know, complementary color um, palette. I made her hair like this bright purple. And another thing when when choosing her colors is that you got to stay minimalist with the colors and not choose too many. You got to make sure all the shapes are readable and interesting. And so I have the the spikes in her hair to sort of um, to show off her kind of mean personality. And so whenever I'm um, creating pixel art, I always break down everything into shapes, as you can see. Um, this image that I have to the right isn't Alice, but it's a it's a, just a different pixel art that I did. And that was sort of my process for creating her. Okay, and so for this one, this isn't even related to the game, but I think this is just honestly like kind of a uh, a short like tip for a couple of tips for how to strengthen pixel art. And so actually this image is from my brother. The the one on the left is from his from my brother. And so he was trying to recreate a character from Toho Project. And um, I think what he focused on first was particularly the shading and the, the textures of the shading specifically. And the thing that I think honestly could have really helped is I'll actually show you an image uh, um, of the character. I think it's Remu, right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, as you can see, this is what the actual character looks like. This is what he was trying to recreate. And then the left version was his product. And so I kind of mentored him into um, improving specific aspects about the design. I already thought it was on the right track, but honestly, I thought, obviously, um, her colors could be simplified a bit. Additionally, don't focus on the shading or the, the highlights before you nail down exactly what color would read well with Remu's design. And then just make sure that certain shapes of her clothing are kind of poking out and present. Like for instance, her um, her ribbon, especially, it, it's really, really um, visible from the rest of her hair. And then another thing about pixel art that makes it particularly interesting is that you're dealing with such a low resolution. Um, and you're not able to get all the details. However, what you can do is pick out specific details that you like. Like for instance, if you're looking at her dress, you can see she has a trim around her dress. However, the trim would be too small to replicate in this re resolution of pixel art. So what I actually did was that I made it much larger than normal so that it actually, um, it's readable. So you can tell that there's trim on her dress. So yeah, um, lots of surprising things about pixel art, honestly, but um, it's quite fun to do. Okay, and so um, basically before we did the jam, I had, Henry was sort of practicing pixel art. I was teaching him how to do some stuff. And then this is what he came up with during the jam. And I told him to restrict the colors, um, keep the colors interesting, use simple shapes. And honestly, I really like the results. I think they look pretty good. However, on the other hand, this isn't related to art at all, because uh, honestly, I love the art for the game. But there are some other things that um, we kind of lost control of. And honestly, um, I got too excited about adding content to the game. I mean, you saw all the NPCs I was showing you. There's like a secret agent rabbit. There is a cat. There is a farmer rabbit. There, there are all these NPCs. But the actual core game wasn't really developed. And so... My brother made 120 different props, 120. That is a lot. And a lot of it obviously didn't get into the game. And so um, I only got to see two of the enemies in the final product. Um, a couple of character animations were cut as well. Um, couldn't even get audio in the game. Um, the menus seem pretty static and uninteresting. They could have animations, but they just didn't. I didn't have time for those. I rushed the programming. I didn't use the best practices. Copy pasted a lot of code, um, wrote in some pretty ha terrible hacks for things. 
And then additionally, I mixed responsibility between scripts. Like I had the animation scripts manage specific things in the character and then vice versa. And so uh, when I finally got to putting it all together and debugging the game, um, I got pretty confused. There were lots of education cases that really surprised me and broke the code in ways I didn't expect. Um, it was difficult to change things because my code was pretty much tied up in a knot. And um, that resulted in something really unfortunate, which was um, I couldn't get the rabbits to stop being able to kill you when they're on fire. I really wanted it to be like, when you set them on fire, they can't hurt you anymore. But unfortunately, they still do. And then when you go to destroy the props, you find out that there's actually, um, you actually can't beat the levels because there's some weird thing where like the, the props don't really represent the, the props that you destroy don't really uh, contribute to the destroyed counter properly. And so I rushed play testing. All levels got made two hours before the deadline. Um, and so a lot of things got um, improperly tuned. And so um, I've had some, ex I've had a, another experience like that. I've only done one other game jam, which was Sprout and two different teams. I, I was working on a team of five people, but it was pretty much the same idea. Um, we struggled with these chain mechanics. We wanted them to be really cool. And, um, but unfortunately we were making them too fancy and it was being becoming really, really difficult to manage the rest of the game. And so we ran out of time. And so same thing with Alice Inferno. I think we spent too much time on content and laughs, but not so much on the actual aspects of the game. And so the most important thing for games and your game jams is to focus on the game. And I know that's pretty obvious, but like, if you don't have a game that's playable and well-contained, um, then it's not gonna be fun in the end. You, you want it to be both of those things. Like for instance, don't add a secret agent rabbit before you got fun playable levels with regular rabbits in them already. And so these two things that I'd like to mention, playability and containment. Uh, playability is ensuring that your player knows what the start and the end point of the game is from the get-go and uh, making sure your players have a good reason to remain with the game, such as replayability, difficulty, but still fun, and the ability for players to experiment with mechanics. And then with containment, you don't want the player to know that they're playing a game in the engine that you made. I say that as a like a general a general case, but like you don't want them to notice out of bounds areas, um, visual artifacts, and then game breaking glitches. You want them to contain, you want to contain the players within the game. And so here's an example. Um, as you can see, my levels have like an out of bounds area that's clearly visible. What I would do to strengthen that is just obviously um, get rid of that, just add more tiles underneath. But like another thing I do is, as you can see, there's this uh, big ugly wall at the beginning of the game. I would get rid of that as well um, because that's unnatural. And then I would add some more scenery to the background to make it look more like a world rather than just like um, a thing. I don't know. Um, and then playability as well. You, you want the player to be able to identify an objective. And so having UI elements on the screen, unfortunately, this was in, none of this was in the game. Um, I would add just like counters and like health bars and things, and then maybe a pointer to where the portal is. So you know where the player, so the player knows where they're supposed to go. And so, yeah, um, those are the things that I would add. And so with these elements, I hope to stay strong and continue doing game jams. And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. All right. Lots of lots of muted applause, but applause nonetheless. That was, that was great. Oh, no, I, I could hear it in my mind, for sure. <laughs> I'm loving right. your comments, you guys. Oh yeah, like honestly, one of the things that I would say, because it seems like you've had two game jams where you've like struggled to hit a deadline. No offense, I don't mean that. It's like a rude thing. Well, yeah, it's yeah, just, no, like sure. that's one of the hardest things to do. Like honestly, that's what a game jam really tempers, and that's the reason that I love them so much. Is they temper your expectations so you can say, okay, I have project with time deadline X. I can't go to infinity, and. It's impossible to fully learn that prop, but it, you can get towards a better, like almost blocking 
certain features? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, um yeah. I I definitely should have gotten the the main features working as soon as possible. Um even if even if I was even if I was going to use like placeholder programmer art or something like that. I I want the game to be still playable, you know? Mm. But yeah. Um yeah, Sprout was pretty tough. Um but yeah, yeah, thank you guys for your comments. Um despite all the some of the negative things I've said, I've, I actually really did enjoy this jam. Um, it was a really excellent learning experience for sure. But yeah, um, does anyone want to go next? I, I can go next. Um, can y'all hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can hear you. cool. All right, because I was finicking with my mic earlier. Um, all right, so we participated as um as gator vr uh in the in uh the the roots game jam the 2023 global game jam uh let me share my screen real quick can y'all can y'all see this all right yes. so um this is the itch.io page um i don't know where to start so this was my first game jam um most of us actually this was my first full game uh everything i've done prior to this since 2019 has been prototypes um self-taught working off of youtube videos and such um and here's my presentation um so oh that's there we go um so it was four of us uh two artists and two programmers um and we started with big ideas, as I feel that most of us who do game jams for the first time start with. Um, the, we, we, we came into it with uh, um, uh, lots, of, lots of aspects to our game, rather than focusing on one root, like necessity, uh, root. Um, but essentially, so we, we had four plans. We had four uh, aspects to our game. The idea was that we had this tree and you needed to heal the tree and um, and, and save it with um, in order to like uh, bring life back to this canyon. Um, and so we had four little aspects um, that would heal each of the four roots to the tree. We had uh, an art scene where you'd have a paintbrush. We'd have uh, a dancing scene where it would like uh, you'd have like some NPC you'd follow and dance with. Uh, we had an, a music scene where we had drums and then. Um, there was a puzzle and it was supposed to be the four aspects of like what it takes to be a well-rounded person, you know, art, music, dance, and then some kind of wisdom. Um, and you'd have to break the rock and it would flood the, the, the canyon. And, and in the bottom picture, we would, you know, uh, flourish. Uh, we ended up spending an entire day working on just the drums, um, learning or relearning uh, collisions, relearning timing, relearning, um, essentially unity xr features um as i said this is our first game jam getting back into vr this was uh about a month after i refounded the club um and so yeah we started off with a lot of ideas and dismaled them down into one sole idea but i feel like that idea uh uh came to fruition uh we ended up sticking with the drums so essentially you had a timed uh music something like beat saber where uh, objects would fall, hit the drum, you'd have to hit the drum that, that lit up in, in the order. Um, and then a song was played in the background. Um, none of us were artists uh, music wise. So we stuck with an AI generated song. We went online and, and it was just um, uh, some neat little bot that did uh, cool music for background or stuff. So, the, so the, the theme, the main theme is all AI generated, and then the main song you're playing is also AI generated, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, so, but our main feature, or, or here's some models, hold on. So our main feature is the drums. Um, and essentially you've got, this is from the first person perspective. Uh, you've got a little, a drum set that you're playing. Uh, you start off at the top of the mountain and you wander your way down. And this is kind of the only place to go. Let me see actually if I can pull up the, hold on, it's in my other. One second. Um, I have a complete video here of gameplay. Let me see if I can just. So 
you start off kind of at the top of this mountain and you're looking around at um, um, the environment and you see it's kind of a desolate wasteland and then there's a little tree that needs to be watered or something. Uh, and so you're following down to the to this this blue light and then we kind of just figured you'd figure it out. Uh, you grab the drumsticks from their spot and then every time you hit one on time, it adds to the number uh, and over time, the drums, uh, the, the rocks in front of you will, will break and the scene slowly starts to fill with water um, as the dam crashes, essentially. And then at the end, when you hit like 60 or something, it's, um, hold on. Yeah, so the whole, the whole field turns green and there's more trees and such. Um, and so the music aspect was essentially a lot of code. Um, Keith did most of it. Uh, neither of us have any rhythm. Um, but essentially what we did is we played the song on his, on his phone and we set up a timer. And every time I felt like there should be a beat, I hit the timer. And so we used that spacing to figure out when we needed to spawn the circles and have them and track the time it took them to get to the spot. And then uh, all through uh, I enumerators and all that jazz. Um, and so these are some of the models, some of the examples. We have a, a paintbrush and a paint bucket. Uh, we have the, the canyon, the tree, the initial tree. Um, and yeah, and so this is kind of like just the art that went into the background. Um, necessities, of course. Um, but the main feature was these were these drums that the player would use, sort of like a Beat Saber-esque environment. Um, yeah, and so... The, the second main feature is, is when you've completed your, um, your drum set, hold on, the entire game turns into sort of like a Bob Ross scenery. So you're given a paintbrush and a small menu, which is a really neat little thing. There's, a, there's a paintbrushes on your hands, and when you, tip, when you dip the tip of the paintbrush into the bucket, uh, you are actually, you're changing the color of the paintbrush, and you're using different colored paints. Um, and so at the end here, the whole thing turns into a Bob Ross scenery, and you can draw in 3D. Um, and, and just, it's a kind of like a reward, uh, for, for completing the game. Um, yeah. And that's, that's kind of the gist of our project. I don't really know what else I can talk about, but, uh, any suggestions? Oh, one of the, one of the main things, sorry, uh, let me, one, one second. One of, one of the main things is, especially for VR games like this, is that you have to make the player feel like they're not in a video game. And while we went with a simplistic style, the idea was to um, using, especially with things like uh, the colliders on the drums and, you know, you actually have to be there. You have to be in the game. You have to feel everything so that you can, you know, interact with the interactables and you can um, interact with your environment and such. Um, and you really couldn't get this through, like drums are cool, if you're playing with your keyboard and you know you've got four buttons and you got to hit the four buttons on time or um and then we got closer to it with um uh what was the the wii game with uh the guitar guitar hero where you've got your physical guitar and you've got buttons on the guitar but now we're playing in a, in a game where we are physically there everything is around us and now we're holding the drums and colliding uh in the in in actuality um so yeah, so so then the limitations, of course, uh, the player can do whatever they want, essentially. Um, we don't have any kind of restrictions. The most restriction we have is if you saw the little blue uh, cylinder, that keeps you still while you're standing at the drums, so you can't just walk away from the drums until you finished your music. However, you can hit the drums however you'd like. And the issue with the colliders is, um, as an, uh, uh, um, when I would play it, Keith kept asking me how I was getting a high score. If you just drag the, the, the drumstick across the uh, across the drums while the, the circles are hitting, you're bound to hit them on time um, as long as you're going fast enough. So we had little implementations that we were like, well, we could fix this or we could finish the game and get it done by the end of the jam. And we were up until, I'm going to say, 5 o'clock in the morning on Saturday and then decided, all right, we'll be back at 9 to finish it. Uh, and we got it done by 11. But yeah, I slept three hours through the entirety of the game jam, essentially, um, except for Saturday or for Friday night. But yeah, so all right, that's that's uh, any questions? There's yeah.
Oh, I have a, there's a chat. Oh, I have a question. Am I only sharing Chrome? Oh, did I not show the video? Did I, did that mess up? Can you guys see this or hold on? Oh, I was only sharing one. Okay, hold on one second. I will, how do I change which, here we go. There. And then if we go to the other, this. Oh, sorry. So this is, this is what I was showing with the, the music. So essentially you're hitting the drums until, um, why does it do that? Uh, until the rock breaks. Um, and then at like 20, the water starts flooding and then the farther you go, the environment changes into more of a green landscape that is then given with the, the, the paintbrush in the end. So we stuck with simple, um, I think there's also a clip of me in here. There's a part where the song gets really quick and I will just drag the drumsticks across the, the, the entire set because the colliders allow you to just, um, uh, they, they don't have, like they're not detecting the top only, they're detecting the entire thing and it's kind of a cube. And so if you just keep dragging, it, it collides. Um, so we didn't really have time to fix that, but we got the game mostly done and it was playable. Um, as this was our first jam. Um, so yeah, now that y'all have seen that, and then this is the rest of the environment with the, uh, oops, you fall out and then there's the tree above you and the, the sun and the sky and, and then the canyon and you're walking around and you could walk down the steps. And then the only thing that I actually modeled for this project <laughs> were these these little lily pads. I made those in Fusion 360 because that's the only modeling software I know how to use. But yeah, so that was my little contribution to the art. I also did the paintbrush, but yeah. Um, yeah, so any questions? That's, that's, that's my presentation. I didn't have much to show off. That's a lot, that's sick. There's, that's not, not much, you got like, Man, this is like several features. That's that's really cool. You guys yeah, don't this see is like the first game jam, right? Did you guys yeah. all miraculously know how to, to use Unity really well? So I've been working on Unity since 2019. Um, and everything I've done, well, sorry, the only Unity I've ever done is using XR. Um, so I've only worked on VR games. I've never done a simple 3D desktop game. Uh, I probably should at some point. But I've only ever worked in theaters. So I've been through like update after update after update with Valum videos. And because you know they've been working on it was in like beta when I started. It was on like it was a it was a free release you had to install to get the XR interactable toolkit. And now I'm like working with they've got all these like I had to build an XR rig to begin with. You had to build your 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 empty game object with your camera with the offset and then like all of that stuff. And now you can just go and right click and hit you know, XR and create a rig. And it's just right off the bat. Um, Keith had some uh, projects for you when he was in high school. He lived to so the yeah, experience. Yeah, I was able to get most of what you said, but I think I have some issues with your mic. Miles, you've gradually gone from like Miles to, to evil Terminator over the last too 45 loud seconds. I think it's using, whether it's my desktop or my headset, it it's not like a crunchy loudness thing. It's like a, it's like the pitch has been somehow removed <laughs> by like some compression algorithm. Like like it's fascinating. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not I'm not modifying anything. I don't even have it. Wait, wait, wait. Uh can you say something for me? Yeah. Uh, I... say say Decepticons roll out. <laughs> Decepticons roll out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn into a truck now. That's my favorite line from Transformers. No, sorry, I I can't fix that. I'm not even I'm not even trying this. Um, no, but so this is our first game jam. This is my first complete game. The only thing I've worked on previously were prototypes. I've done a few I've done a few Harry Potter based games. I made a Quidditch uh, back in like when I first started. It was my first game. I did a broomstick, and you could catch the snitch and throw the quaffle on a ledge as. 
and then I made a wand a few years later. Um, but yeah, no, so we were just, everything we've done in Unity is Valorant tutorials and rookies, and even now, working with my dev teams in my club, uh, both of us, like, teams are focused on Valorant videos and Valorant tutorials. And, you know, I feel like that's the best way to learn. I've been possessed. That's, is, is it really awful? Is it sound that awful? Is it the interview? It's just, it's like the pitch is removed. Like it's like every like three out of five audio samples are just like gone. And so you That's sound, it, it's, you sound like, right? Can I watch it is, later? it is. Yeah, I'm sure you'll, you'll okay. hear it. it. You sound like a robot. Like there's no pitch to your voice. There is only mm -hmm. like, bruh, 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 bruh. like it's, it's, but it's still really understandable. Just, yeah. Yeah, I used in the game, I checked the mic. No, so yeah, we had it just cut it it's like cut out now yeah you're it's cutting like out now some whispers came in but that's yeah. gotta be the internet then Hold oh on. no it's back yeah uh, can you hear me okay <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you, we can hear you. <laughs> okay so I'm sorry, we lied. We did not figure that out. The Ethernet ports all the way over there. If it's the internet, you can try like turning off the camera. Sorry, that, that's true. I think this might be like a software like Zoom issue or something. Like if I had to mm -hmm. guess, this is like it, it. It's almost the effect that like CPU lag has when your mouse starts like slow motion gliding around your desktop. It's like that's happening to the audio. Like it's. Like I, mean, I was going to try choosing a different microphone, but I only have this and my Oculus virtual audio device that I can't use. So um, my robotic tendencies tend to stop me. That's a shame. It's it's 1984. They're trying to stop me. They don't want, they don't want me to present this information. It's, it's the government. Who's who owns Zoom? Um, no, but I mean, if I can, if I can speak, it's, it's, the idea of no music knowledge. We found it. Choose genre and style, and then like the piece within it. And we just like we found it. We found a nice background music, and then we found a song, and that was it. And then I just tried. It. Oh yeah, what website is that that you use to generate that song? Yeah, so so it's um, but it was really simple. You had to get a pro version to download the song, but if you just opened OBS and recorded it, it um, nice. we're not in this anyway. So it was it was yeah, not copyrighted or anything like that. That's hilarious. Yeah, no. So that's that was our project. Yeah, no musical previous, no no musical knowledge previously. I can barely play my ukulele. Um, but it was, uh, it was, it worked out because, like, yeah, initially it was just going to be that the drums would light up and you'd hit them every time they lit up, almost like uh, that little memory game with the four sections after they play in an order. Um, and Keith was like, well, that's kind of boring and it doesn't actually make a song. They're just making bongo noises. And he's like, what if we put a song on that? I see. I'm the link right now. Oh, what is the trick? I did this today. Oh, unfortunately, I can't hear the music. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, maybe maybe we could like put it in uh, Discord. I could totally hear. I I, to I I I kind of muted it intentionally because I'm not sure if there are noises from my Oculus headset in the background. But I will try. Um, it's this video here. So if we play this one, this has. <laughs> Let's 
this piece of the sausage by an AI. Um, but yeah, so essentially it's I don't know what rhythm I was following. It's just whenever I felt like something I would have to hit the, the drum, I would tap the I would tap the the timer, the stopwatch on Keith's phone, and we just use the timings from that to create the song. You can hear this now, right? Yeah, yeah. Your voice okay. is no longer a robot voice. Oh well that's good too. We forgot to take out the bongo noises. So you still hear the bongo noises that don't match up with the song at all, but it sounded better than leaving it without it. So, and there are parts of it where it gets really quick that I just like can't keep up with. Like, um, yeah. But as you can see, more of the boulders have been destroyed and the water starts filling up a little higher. And then, um, and then once the water's at its peak, the, the valley turns green, the plants come back, and the lily pads appear, and then you can walk away. There you go. I see. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, see, there was oh just... Oh, my God, it's getting so fast. I can't... So a uh, quick question. We don't have to cut this presentation off, but is there anyone else that wants to present today? Because we are over time. So we can oh, continue with this. It's, it's not a problem. That. Uh, just is there anyone else that's going to present today? Because I want to give them a chance to present. Well, most of us, you know. All well, right, I didn't see like a whole lot of I didn't see a whole lot of submissions in the um what's speak it now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think that's pretty much it, right? Yeah, I just saw there was a bunch of people that I haven't heard speak at all or so I just wanted to give them a chance if they were here for that or just to watch, you know. If you, I I scheduled you guys, you four, so I'm really happy with uh, the presentations. Um, if anyone else wants to join in randomly, I mean, go ahead, have fun. <laughs> um, but it's been it's been great. Thank you guys so much, it's so so much, it's so cool. Yeah, this was fun. Alrighty, take care everybody.